Well, at this time, we'll move forward with introducing our speaker. Um, we are honored today to have Dr. Courtney Siegert from Mississippi State University join us for our Hanover Lecture Series. Uh, Courtney is an associate professor in the Department of Forestry at Mississippi State University. Her research interests include forest hydrology, biogeochemistry, and watershed response to natural and anthropogenic disturbance. She uses her background as a physical geographer to seek and understand the complex dynamics between forests and their surrounding environments across spatial and temporal scales. Her lab conducts field experiments in diverse forest systems across the southeastern United States and around the world. Uh, she and her group work to answer questions regarding the impact to water and nutrient cycles through forest management and restoration. Uh, very honored to have Courtney here today. She and I worked together through graduate school at uh, the University of Delaware and are proud blue hens. And I'm um, just really happy to hear about your research today. So thank you for joining us virtually, Courtney, and the floor is all yours. Great, thank you so much for that introduction, Asia. And thank you all for inviting me to um, share some of my research with you today. So first I'm going to share my screen. All right, um, hopefully you can see the PowerPoint in there. Um, and so I'm going to talk about a specific component of my research today. And um, if you have questions as we're going along, you can put them up in the chat and then I'll answer them in order um, when I'm finished. And so the title of my talk today is A Tale of Tree Bark, How Morphology and Structure Influence Hydrology. I spend a lot of my time thinking about how water and nutrients move through the forest canopy and how the canopy modifies both the quantity and the quality of that water that's input into the soils. And then how um, that influences soil biogeochemistry and what's going on with nutrient cycling in the soils. And so I think about it in terms of forest management techniques in different types of forest systems. I'm starting to do a lot of work in short rotation woody crops grown for bioenergy. Um, and so today I'm specifically going to be talking about some work that I do in upland oak forest. And before I get started, um, I wanna thank and acknowledge all of my tremendous collaborators and co-authors. Uh, this is a kind of a summary of work that I've been doing for um, about seven or eight years. And it has had a lot of folks that have been involved, a lot of places that we've been able to use as experimental force and a lot of funding sources. And so uh, my main collaborator on this has been Heather Alexander, who's currently at Auburn University, as well as, as, well as Anna Elek, who's at Poznan University in Poland, and my research associate, Kate Booth and Marcus Lashley, who's a faculty at the University of Florida. Uh, I'm gonna talk about some of the field sites and uh, none of this would have been possible without the many, many undergraduate students and graduate students that I've had working on these projects throughout the years. So first we're gonna do and start with an overview of forest hydrology. Um, so when I, when I spend my time thinking about how water and nutrients move through the forest canopy, I'm looking at two specific ways in particular in through fall and stem flow. So when it rains, rainwater passes through the forest canopy and some of it's caught on the leaves and it'll stay on the leaves and it'll evaporate back up into the atmosphere. And that's considered canopy interception. And that's a net loss to the system because that water never makes it to the forest floor. The majority of water that makes it to the forest floor lands on a leaf and passes through the forest canopy and is deposited to the ground. And that's what we consider through fall. And so through fall is spatially um, heterogeneous depending on canopy conditions. And it makes up about 70% of total precipitation. Stem fall on the other hand is water that has been intercepted by the forest canopy and then funneled down the stems and the branches to the main trunk of the tree. And that water gets deposited immediately around the base of the tree. Stem fall represents less than 5% of total rainfall. But at the individual tree level, we're talking about dozen, tens um, to 50 to 100 liters of water per rainfall event. And what's unique about stem flow is that that is water 
that is getting delivered directly to an individual tree's root system. And so that water is not necessarily being shared or accessible by surrounding trees through competition. Whereas through fall may fall through any part of the canopy and as it falls towards the canopy edge, a neighboring tree's root system may be able to access that water. So Stemflow is a unique way that trees are able to direct water immediately to their own root systems without sharing it with neighboring trees. And as this water moves through the forest canopy, it washes off dry deposition, so particles that have accumulated during dry periods um, that can be nutrients or pollutants, and it also leaches nutrients from plant surfaces. So things like calcium, potassium, magnesium, carbon can be leached out from plant tissues, including leaves and stems as, it, as the water funnels down the tree. And so then when that stem flow is um, delivered to the forest floor, it's nutrient enriched water as well. So like I said, through fall is spatially heterogeneous. Here are two pictures on the left. Left, we have a loblolly pine canopy. And on the right, we have a dense hardwood canopy um, in the mid-Atlantic. And so you can see that there are parts of the canopy looking upwards that have many overlapping layers of leaves. And there's also layers that have large gaps. And so depending on what, what rain is moving through what parts of the canopy will impact how much water makes it to the ground as through fall or how much makes it, how much is intercepted and what the nutrient content of that water looks like. There are many things that influence the rate of through, that influence through fall variability, like canopy heterogeneity, the gaps and the discontinuity in the canopy, the understory composition and the structural arrangement of the canopy layers, the rainfall characteristics itself. So whether rainfall is very intense um, or if it's a very gentle rainfall, that will impact how much water can be retained on the foliage versus how much is going to be displaced and um, bounce off in small droplet forms. If we scale in, we can look at leaf and branch orientation. And so different trees have different structures. Some of them have more erectophile branching so that we have more vertical branches like this one here in B or so. And so when water is captured on that branch, it will very easily be funneled down that branch to the stem to generate through fall or stem flow. Whereas some trees have more plagiophile branching, which is a more horizontal structure. And so that's not as conducive to that movement. Um, leaves exhibit similar structures as well. Some trees hold their leaves more vertically and some hold them more horizontally. And then we have leaf surface characteristics. And um, one of those characteristics is hydrophobicity or how um, repellent that leaf surface is to water. And so here in this picture right here, you can see that the water is beaded up on top of that leaf surface, and that's going to make that water more easily dislodged by wind or other disturbance types. Whereas if the water sits um, flatter onto the surface, it'll cling more readily and not be as easily dislodged. Stem flow hat variability is influenced by many of those same characteristics, but it's also influenced by bark. And so here are three different pictures of bark from common species in the southeastern United States. On the left is Loblolly pine, in the middle is white oak, and on the right is pignut hickory. And so you can see from the outside, all of these trees have very different bark. And that bark structure is going to influence how water runs down that tree or gets absorbed into the bark surfaces and stored there. And if it gets absorbed into the bark, then that is taking away that water flux from stem flow. So bark morphology is important for determining stem flow variability. The more variable of the species composition in the stand, the more variable the bark morphology is going to be. And so the more variable the stem flow will be at the stand level. Also branching geometry. So this is more important in stem flow than it is in through fall uh, because it will help channel that water down to the trunk as opposed to letting it drip um, somewhere out on the canopy edges. And rainfall characteristics. And so here's just an example of two different intensity rainfall events and how um, complete the stem flow generation is, how um, interconnected the flow paths are when we have higher stem flow generate higher 
more rainfall and therefore higher stem flow generation. So this, so after that background, this brings us into kind of the main topic that I'm going to be talking about today, and that's mesification. So in the eastern United States, um, a dominant forest type is the oak hickory forest types, as seen here in the, the darker green. And so this is the dominant forest type in the central hardwoods region, and it stretches down into many of the southern states as well. So you can see that there's a lot of oak hickory forest in Mississippi too. And in these forests, historically, through indigenous peoples and previous to that through natural lightning occurrences, these systems were maintained by fire. So there was frequent low intensity fire that would burn through these systems, through these upland oak hickory forest, and burn off understory competition and leave oaks and hickories that are more fire tolerant behind. And the and this constant kind of like High, intent, or high frequency, low intensity fire would create conditions that open woodland type conditions as you see in this picture here. And so this was part of the natural fire disturbance cycle that would be caused by lightning strikes in the summertime when um, drier conditions would exist and the forest was flammable. And then it was adapted by indigenous peoples to maintain that open forest structure to allow for easier movement and use of the forest systems. But beginning in the 1900s, wide-scale forest fire suppression became common throughout both the Eastern and the Western United States following some very large fires. And with the elimination of this kind of persistent fire disturbance, we're getting forest systems that look like this now. And um, in a recent article, well, it's about 15 years old now, using FIA data, um, Faye and Steiner found that recent increases in red maple abundance are almost ubiquitous on a state-by-state -state basis throughout the species natural range. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing fire intolerant species start to colonize these sites that would have normally been excluded from the sites because of the presence of fire. And so these fire intolerant species that also tend to be shade tolerant um, dominate and colonate the forest and create these shaded, damper, cooler conditions that are not favorable for oak regeneration because oaks need um, sorry, higher light conditions um, for regeneration. And so we're seeing an, a widespread shift in forest composition. To try to combat this though, we as forest managers are putting prescribed fire back on the landscape. And so this includes low intensity fires like the one you see here in this figure with the goal, um, with the main objective of this fire to kill off understory regeneration of species that are not tolerant of fire like red maple, elms, hickories, and, and the oaks um, that would be left over would be able to move on to advanced stages of regeneration. And so this is the idea of mesification, so that without the continued pressure of fire disturbance, these systems are closing and they're becoming darker, they have lower light conditions, because they have more canopy layers, they're, um, it, the humidity in the forest is increasing, uh, less sunlight is getting to the ground for evaporation. And over time, we're creating this positive feedback cycle whereby we have the forests are less capable of igniting and we're less capable of using prescribed fire to restore forests to the previous conditions that we're interested in. And we care so much about oaks because they are a keystone species in this ecosystem. The mass that they provide for wildlife is invaluable. The timber that they provide for many industries is very um, important, including in the bourbon industry and white oak in particular. And so we care about oak regeneration and sustaining oak dominance in these forests for a myriad of reasons. And when we think about the mesification hypothesis, we think about it as a light issue because we have, we're going from open canopy conditions, open savanna woodland type conditions 
to close canopy forests. And in these closed canopy conditions, there's not enough light for oak regeneration. Whereas the competitor species like red maple are able to persist in low light. And so here are some preliminary data that we've gathered um, that shows light levels underneath oak species. Um, so here oaks have these kind of like shallower, less dense canopies and mesophytes, which is the general term that we use for these species that are encroaching in on these forests and creating these more mesic conditions with red maple being the poster child of mesification. And so they tend to have underneath their canopies have lower light availability. So we know it's a light issue and we want to open back up the canopies um, through the use of prescribed fire to allow more light to the forest floor to improve the chances of oak regeneration. And so here are some data of this oak bottleneck theory. So oak seedlings are present in many of these forests, but they're only able to subsist for a few years before they die off. And in these um, sites where we have sampled, in blue, you'll see that these are the mesophyte or the hypothesized mesophyte species, and the red are oak species. And so take, for example, here in Mississippi, this is the percent of trees in that forest stand in the seedling stage. So we have a whole lot of mesophytes, but we also have about 25% oak in the seedling stage. So 25% of the understory composition is oak. That's a good thing. But when we get to the sapling stage, our oak composition is falling out. We've dropped down to less than 10%. And so this is the oak bottleneck that we're experiencing throughout the range of the upland oak hickory forest, as you can see here in Kentucky too. We still have oaks in the overstory because those are the ones that have established prior to the um, manipulation of the natural fire regime. But the problem is, is that once these oaks in the overstory die out, we don't have oaks moving into the sapling in the midstory phase to replace them. And if we can't get oak regeneration out of the seedling stage, that eventually we're going to have a wholesale turnover in the overstory composition um, without additional intervention. So like I said, we are trying to use, and we forest managers as a whole are trying to use prescribed fire to restore oaks to these previous conditions, but we are not as successful as one would think. And so my contribution and my colleague's contribution to this advancing idea of the musification hypothesis is that beyond a light problem, it's also a water problem. And if we have moisture forest conditions, then it, the stands are going to become less flammable. And then that means that no amount of fire is going, are, we're not going to be able to start fire in the landscape and that we're not going to be able to use prescribed fire as an effective tool to manage these systems and that we might need other silvicultural options such as hacking squirt and thinning to achieve the goals that we're trying to do. But to start thinking about this water issue. And so we have these two kind of like hypothesized forest or tree structures of oaks on the left and mesophytes on the right. So oak trees have shallower, more open crowns. They have thicker, they have rougher barks. These are all kind of like general observations that you would find in the description of these species. And mesophyte trees tend to have deeper, denser crowns because they're more shade tolerant. So they can have leaves in those lower light conditions. They also tend to have thinner and smoother bark. So the question is, if oak species, upland oak species, have shallower crowns, then they should have more fruit fall, so more water making it to the forest floor. But if they have thicker and rougher bark, which means more bark to absorb in rainwater, then they would probably have less stem flow making it to the forest floor. In contrast, mesophytes, because they have denser and deeper crowns, will likely have lower through fall making it to the forest floor because more of that water is going to be intercepted by the canopy and evaporate back to the atmosphere. But because they have thinner and smoother bark, they will probably be more efficient and capable at generating stem flow. So the question becomes, what is the balance between these two contrasting traits? Um, does higher through fall and less stem flow lead to more or less soil moisture than lower through fall and more stem flow? And so that's what we set about to do in a series of experiments to understand this question. 
because we've measured what's going on in the forest canopy and the water that's coming through these forest canopies, but we've never tied it back into soil moisture directly. And so the reason that we care about water is because if we're going to use prescribed fire as a tool, we need to be able to get the forest to burn. And in this picture, you can see that while this wasn't a very intense burn at all, we still have some of these like coarser woody debris on the ground. We see pockets of the forest floor that didn't burn at all around individual trees. Even these tiny little saplings over here, they have areas around them where the fire didn't carry. And one of the hypotheses that we have for this is because the ground itself is actually moister around that individual. There are contributing um, factors here that some mesophyte leaves are actually less flammable than oak leaves. And so the leaves themselves won't burn in addition to that leaf mass and that fuel bed being moisture and wetter anyway. And so our theory is that um, if you look at this kind of ball and cup diagram with and we're moving from different ecosystem states as we exclude fire. And so we exclude fire and we have more mesophytes colonizing the landscape. And when we have a few mesophytes on the landscape here in blue, so the trunk, the stem is the dark blue circle and the light blue is kind of like the zone of influence of that individual. And then the red, um, dark red is the oak stem and the light red around it is the zone of influence of that individual. When we have forest compositions like this, we're still up here in this ball and cup diagram. We can put fire on that landscape, get that blue dot out of there and maintain a more open composition. But we also have forests that look like this. We have lots of blue dots. We have understories that are completely colonized by mesophytes, by red maples. Um, and though at their zone of influence, while it's individually small, connect together and create these landscapes that are less flammable and take us over the edge um, and into a, a portion of the ball and cup diagram that makes it very difficult to get back, back out of. And at this point, prescribed fire is not going to get us there. We would need additional silvicultural interventions. And so somewhere between this kind of schematic on the left and this one on the right is where all of our forests in the central hardwoods and the upland oak systems exist. And so if we wanna focus our restoration efforts on where fire will be the most effective, we need to understand the transition between these two, between across this spectrum so that we can understand where to focus our efforts. So we have these management questions that arise. So I'm going to address four of these today and show you some research that I've been conducting that provides some evidence of what's going on. So how do individual species affect canopy water, part water partitioning? So how does that dense crown, that rough bark impact the amount of fruit ball and stem flow that makes it to the forest floor? Then how does the change in this balance of the canopy partitioning impact soil moisture? What is the response of soil moisture around individual trees? Third, what are the physical and structural characteristics of the trees that are important for determining this balance? And fourth, can fire alter these characteristics? So our first question, looking at individual species effect on canopy water partitioning. So this occurred at two sites in Mississippi here um, in Starkville and that um, in the SAR in the middle of the state and up at Spirit Hill Farm in the northeast, northwestern part of our state. And our forest looks something like this. So we have oaks in the overstory, but we have a lot of mesophytes in the midstory and understory. And here they're red maple, they're different types of hickories, there's a lot of winged elm, there's some yellow poplar, which after talking to a lot of land managers seems to be a big issue coming into oak forests that are being managed with fire. Um, and any number, but red maple is kind of like the, the species that's on everybody's radar and then kind of locally, there are different mesophytes that are in the area too. And in this study, we looked at white oak and red oak, so two oak species, mockernut hickory, which historically occurred in upland oak forest, but has characteristics that are sometimes related to oaks and sometimes more towards um, the categories of mesophytes. 
and red, and then we had red maple and winged elm that we looked at. So we collected stem flow from these trees in the overstory and the midstory, and we all. Uh, and we also measured through fall um, underneath the canopies of each individual trees. And here are the results of the through fall. So through fall, even we're not seeing big differences. In the mid story here on the left, in blue, we have our mesophytes, red maple, acerubrum, um, hickory, caria tomentosa, winged elm, amicillata, white oak, quercus alba and um, southern red oak, Quercus falcata. So our oaks are in red and our mesophytes are in blue. And in the mid story, we see an increase in through fall partitioning of um, red, our red oak, our southern red oak, but all the other species are very similar. Uh, the southern red oaks in this study were, they were, they were larger than the rest of our mid story species. So they kind of stand out on here. And, and I don't think that they're really representative of of what red oaks across the region are doing. So just take that with kind of like a, put an asterisk next to that one and keep that in mind. But in the overstory, there's no difference in the rates of average through fall partitioning. So this is the percent of rainfall that makes it to the forest floor. And this is averaged across the entire growing season. So when there's leaves on the tree and when there's leaves not on the tree. And if we look at the cumulative amount of through fall, so how much rainwater made it to the forest floor as through fall, it's about the same. There's no real difference um, in these species. But this is where it gets interesting with stem flow. So in the mid story, red maple has almost 5% average stem flow partitioning, whereas our um, oaks, especially the red oak, has close to less than two on average. And in the overstory, the rate of stem flow partitioning is even smaller than in the mid story, but we see the same distinct trend. And so if we scaled up this axis, you would see that the um, red maple and the dark blue is substantially greater than the other species. And if we look at the cumulative stem flow volume expressed as liters per meter squared of basal area, we see that in the mid story, the um, red maple and winged elm are substantially higher than the other oaks. Red maple had three and a half to seven and a half times as much stem flow generated over about one year compared to the oaks. And you can see the numbers for hickory and, and elms as well. But we're talking about 50,000 liters per square meter of basal area compared to the oaks, which is about 5,000. In the overstory, this was a much smaller total quantity, an order of magnitude smaller, so in total around 5,000. Um, but in here, the, um, the, the, sorry, the hickories, which are actually in this light blue here, sorry, that's what threw me off. The hickories have um, about one and a half to three times as much stem flow total um, generation as the rest of as the other species down below. So how does this, so there's not really a difference in fruit ball, but there's a big difference in stem flow among upland oaks and the mesophytes. And so how does this balance itself out in terms of soil moisture? So we collected soil moisture at three different depths at um, seven centimeters, at uh, 12 centimeters, and at 20 centimeters, and at three different points in the forest canopy. So from at the bowl of the tree, kind of at the mid canopy drip point and out at the edge of the forest canopy. And we collected these at the same interval as when we took our, collected our water measurements, but we took them on kind of sister trees, partner trees, because we recognize that collecting stem flow and diverting it and collecting it in that bin is going to impact um, the, the soil moisture around that tree. So we didn't want to measure soil moisture on a tree that we were collecting stem flow on. So instead we found a similar sized tree to partner with our stem flow trees in order to measure um, soil moisture. And so what we found, if we take the average soil moisture from each measurement period and um, compare the difference between that species at that individual measurement period and then find the average difference in um, soil moisture, uh, that's what we see here. So again, we have the mid story on the left and the over story on the right. And the y-axis is, is the difference in volumetric water content from the stand mean, the stand average. 
And so um, a negative value is a wetter condition and a positive value is a drier condition. And so you can see in the mid story that red maple again has wetter conditions underneath of the forest canopy as does that um, the red oaks. And in the overstory, it's really red maple that has the very wet soil moisture conditions around that tree. Um, and then all of the other trees are drier than normal. And so I condensed down, we took those measurements at different distances from the tree bowls, as well as at different depths. And I kind of condensed all of that information to the singular graph for this presentation. But those trends hold still if you, if you zoom in and look at all of those different measurements in there. And if we look over the course of the measurement period, this is the average um, soil moisture with the standard error bars plotted for the mid story on the top. And so that red oak is up there and the top again, but below, right below that is red maple. And in the overstory, red maple is wetter, is moister than average. Um, in all of the periods, except for the summer when it gets like really, really dry out. But when, we're, when we are thinking about using prescribed fire, that usually occurs in the late dormant season. So January, February, March, before, fully, before the trees come out of dormancy, um, because that is the safest time to, to conduct these fires. If you have a wet fall, then fall could be an appropriate time as well. But if you really zoom in on these areas, especially in the overstory, we have substantially wetter conditions underneath these effect crowns that are going to prevent that fuel from catching fire and, and carrying fire across the landscape. And so the question is, what is it about these trees uh, that result, that causes this um, balance to happen? And so, the data that I showed you, that's really the first time that anybody has tied together the canopy water partitioning into the soil moisture partitioning. And so now we want to understand what, what's going on. What do the trees look like that are causing these changes? And so if we look at um, canopy characteristics and bark characteristics, so taking bark thickness, which we measured um, just on the trees themselves and standardizing it for DDH because larger, older trees have thicker bark and younger trees, smaller trees have thinner bark. And so if we standardize for size, we see that in the mid story, I lost my mouse, um, our hickories have thicker bark than the other species. And in the over and the um, red maple have thinner bark relative to their size in the mid story, as well as the overstory. If we look at bark roughness, which is a measure of kind of the depths of the grooves of the bark, so the average distance from the top of the bridge of the bark down into the, the groove or the fissure in the bark, um, and we standardize that again for DDH, we see the same thing. So our red maples have very thin and, and smooth. So if it's not rough, if the bark is not rough, it's very smooth. And our hickories tend to have very rough bark. And we know this observationally, but we can actually measure it and tie it back into the canopy water rates that we're seeing as well. And then lastly, what is the canopy area per basal area? And so in the mid story, mesophytes tend to have larger canopy areas per size when we standardize it to the, the area of the stem, the basal area. And in the overstory though, it's the opposite. And here, this is probably, especially with the red maple, a relic of the fact that red maples are not the dominant overstory trees. They tend to be subdominant, And so um, they're going to be a little bit smaller than their counterparts as well. But standardizing for basal area should even the playing field a little bit. And so we see these different canopy characteristics. And the next step was to throw it all into a PCA, a principal components analysis, and see what comes out. And so here I've done it for both the mid story and the over story. And on the left, we have the mid story. And so putting all of these variables, so here we have the percent stem flow, percent through fall the basal area, the canopy area, the bark roughness, the bark thickness, the diameter at breast height of the tree, and the volumetric water content measurements at the 
canopy edge, at the mid canopy, and the bowl of the tree. And then the dots represent the five mid-story species that were uh, that were of interest with these variables. And so what we see is that the red maple is out here on its own. And in the mid-story, stemfall and throughfall are actually acting in opposite directions sometimes. So we see a trade-off there in stemflow and throughfall in the mid-story. And that stem flow is oppositely related to bark characteristics, as we might expect. In the overstory, we see that stem flow and through fall are acting in concert with each other. So they're moving in the same direction on both of the axis components. Um, and then that bark, bark roughness and thickness over here is very much tied to the volumetric water content at the bowl of the tree. And so we're just digging through the results of this principal components analysis in more detail. And this is kind of like the first time that, that we've really been able to gather everything and put it all together. But it's interesting that they are, that the PCAs are different depending on which canopy layer that you're looking at. And one of the interesting things about the bark is that we saw bark thickness and roughness moving together with stem flow in one instance and moving in opposite directions as stem flow in the overstory. Um, and so I've also been working with um, Dr. Anna Elek to look at the bark characteristics of these individual species. So beyond what we can see on the outside, but the structural, the internal structural characteristics of the bark. And so here are some data looking at bulk density, which is a mass per volume of the bark. <clears throat> and we had slightly different species in this study, but some similar players. So we had two different species of hickories, macronut and pignut. We have post oak and white oak, sweet gum, which is pretty much ubiquitous across the landscape in the Southeast, as well as loblolly pine. And what you can see here is that our hickories have higher density bark. The bulk density of their bark is higher than in the oak species. And the red is for total bark and the gray is for just the outer bark. Um, but they're, they're kind of doing the same thing here. And the opposite of bulk density is porosity. So how much of that bark volume is occupied by pore space? And we see that hickories have lower total porosity. So in a volume of bark, they have more solid mass and less total pore space. And pore space is important because that's where stem flow water is going to go if it can be absorbed into the stem. And remember, hickories have really thick and rough bark, so they should have the capacity to absorb a lot of water. But simultaneously, that bark is very dense and the porosity is very low, so that there's not a lot of room for stem flow water to go into that bark. And that's why we see higher rates of stem flow in these thicker bark species of hickory when we would expect the opposite to occur. And here is looking at bark water storage capacity. And interestingly, there's no real differences in bark water storage capacity. So how much water um, in a, a depth equivalent in millimeters that a centimeter of bark could hold. And one of the re and so although kind of like at the large scale, the bark water storage capacity isn't different, when we um, look at the trait of actual hygroscopicity, it is. And so hygroscopicity is the ability of a surface to absorb water. So when the trees are out in the forest and there's moisture in the atmosphere, as there always is, some of that moisture is going to get absorbed into the bark, so under dry conditions. And depending on the physiochemical structure of that bark, different species are going to be able to absorb more of that water through their hygroscopic properties. And so here we see that the hickories actually have higher hygroscopicity. So even if they have the same water storage capacity, the amount of water that they can readily take up during dry periods from a moist atmosphere is higher than the oaks here that have the different lettering on them. 
And so this is important because under dry conditions, if species bark can absorb moisture from the atmosphere, then when it starts raining and stem flow generation begins, most of that bark space that would be able to fill up with water is already filled up with water. And so there's no more room in that bark for water to go to. And that's an additional mechanism that helps these trees generate more stem flow as opposed to absorbing it into their bark like the oaks might. And to kind of visualize this a little bit, here we have our hypothetical pieces of bark. And if we divide them up, we've got sweet gum, white oak, post oak, and our hickories over here. If we squished all of the solid matter of that macronut hickory down, we would get about half solid bark and half pore space, a little bit more than half is pore space. But for the oaks, the post oak and the white oak, it has a lower density. It has higher porosity and the density is only about 30% 30, 30 of that. So we've got more pore space in this oak to fill up with water compared to in this hickory. But if we account for that hygroscopic water, that water that's going to get absorbed from the atmosphere and be moist inside of that bark all during all conditions, that hygroscopic water, we see that even that level is different. So the hickories are going to have a higher percentage of hygroscopic water stored in their bark compared to the oaks down here and the sweet gum. They're going to have a smaller portion of hygroscopic water. So at the end of the day, the oaks and the and sweet gum here in this instance are going to be able to absorb more water and generate, which will not generate stem flow. And the hickories are going to be able to absorb less water and which will enhance the generation of stem flow because of these internal bark characteristics. Okay, so the last thing really quick is the management considerations. Okay, so we want to put fire on the landscape to open up these forests, but how is that fire actually going to change the, the, the external structures of these, these trees, and what will that mean for our understanding of water partitioning? And so this study was conducted at the Bankhead National Forest in northern Alabama, and we collected samples from chestnut oak, so one of our upland oak species, and loblolly pine. And these came from sand that over the last 15 years have had one of three different fire regime treatments. Either they had not been burned, they had been burned on a cycle on a nine year fire return interval. And so over the period of, of fire, they've had two burns and those that have burned on a three year return interval of fire. And so those stands had actually been burned five times. And so we took bark samples from these trees that have been burned different number of times to understand how the conditions of the bark changed with different intensities or different frequencies of fire. And what we found for bark density is that frequent fire, so the three-year return interval here in yellow compared to the nine-year return interval in orange or the no fire in magenta, in both chestnut oak on the left and loblolly pine on the right resulted in a decrease in bulk density. So the, the bark became less dense and subsequently an increase in porosity. So the more frequent fire created bark that had, had, large, had more pore space in it. Um, and so this is beneficial for trees to withstand fire because it acts as an insulator um, but it also acts as a storage reservoir for more water, which in theory would mean less stem flow generation and less moisture to the forest floor, enabling fire to move through the system more easily with the, all subsequent fires. And in terms of bark water storage, we see that the, the, these data are a little bit messier, um, but for chestnut oak, the more frequent fire led to an increase in bark water storage um, and not in some kind of interacting effects with loblolly pine, and that the bark hygroscopicity, so the amount of water that bark would can absorb from the atmosphere, decreased in loblolly pine among frequent fires. So these results aren't as nice as the bulk density and the porosity, but they still are very interesting to see. And when we do 
experiments to understand how this bark retains moisture. So we saturated the bark and then we put it in an environmental growing chamber and kept it at 20 degrees Celsius for 12 hours and 10 degrees Celsius for 12 hours, simulating day and night conditions and like a typical time of year when prescribed fire would be, um, would be happening. And we see that the bark from trees that had the frequent fire dried out the fastest. So this yellow line here, this is percent moisture loss. So over um, a, a week or more, we see that trees that had very frequent fire dried out much faster in both chestnut oak and loblolly pine than trees that had less frequent fire. So this is tied back to the porosity and the bulk density and the water storage capacity of that bark and how it's changing as, as fire is implemented on the landscape. So this is really interesting because we have evidence of how these species are manipulating the distribution of water moving through the forest canopy. And then we have evidence that shows us that when we put our management regimes back on the landscape that we're further altering these relationships and these processes. So kind of to summarize everything, um, in terms of canopy partitioning and water availability, we observe very large increases in stem flow relative to decreases in throughfall in non-oak species. And that these differences, the, the, the balance leans towards wetter soil moisture conditions around mesophytes because more stem flow is going into the soil, even though there's no change or, or no decrease in throughfall. And so the one caveat to this is that soil moisture is not necessarily the same as fuel moisture because the soil is not what's burning under these conditions. It's the fuel, it's the leaf litter that's sitting on top of the soil moisture. And so this was our first kind of investigation using soil moisture as a proxy for fuel moisture because that's a little bit trickier to get at. But um, so the next step steps are to connect the soil moisture to the fuel moisture in the field. Um, we certainly have um, laboratory evidence for these relationships, but what's actually going on in the field, the trade-offs with plant water uptake and the physiological processes of the trees, um, everything that's kind of happening inside the black box of the soil moisture that we're measuring, we're not, we don't have um, all of those details yet. And we found that non-oaks or mesophytes have physical characteristics that truly do facilitate these mesic conditions in upland oaks beyond just shade and lowering those light levels. They're also creating moister, damper, more humid environments that are less conducive to flammability. And then that fire changes the structural characteristics of the tree bark, which is going to then feed back into this, this cycle and, and alter the dynamics. And so with that, I will take any questions. Thank you so much for a great talk, Courtney. Um, uh, like Courtney said, we'll take questions now. And for those who are attending in the audience, please feel free to um, unmute yourself and just uh, speak your question, or you're more than welcome to enter it into the chat as well. Stop sharing. So while we wait, I have a question for you, Courtney, and that is, um, can you explain a little bit more how you and your team went about measuring the hydroscopicity of the bark? Okay, so to measure hyd hydroscopicity, um, what we do, so first we destructively sampled the barks from the trees. And so we went out with hammers and chisels and we chiseled down into the, the bark all the way down to the cambium and carefully pried it off of the tree and brought it back to the lab in one piece. And we have multiple samples from each tree. And um, to do the hygroscopicity, what we do is we start with a dry piece of bark and we put um, silicone over all surfaces except for the external surface. So we wanna mimic what that piece of bark would experience, would be exposed to in the field. So that moisture would only be absorbed through that outside layer of the bark. And so we silicone off the rest of it so moisture can't get into it. And then we take that piece of bark 
and we put it in a desiccator like that you would have in a lab that you put desiccant in to keep moisture out. But instead of having desiccant in the desiccator, we fill the bottom layer with water. And so then when you have that water in the bottom layer, that part of that water will diffuse into the atmosphere inside the desiccator and create a 100% relative humidity environment. And so then we put the bark samples into the desiccator that has the 100% relative humidity environment. And we every two days or more frequently at first, and then kind of every two days until we reach mass stabilization, we pull the samples out and we weigh the mass change. And so the samples increase in mass over time because they're absorbing moisture from that 100% humidity environment. And so then once they reach mass stabilization, at some point they're not going to absorb any more moisture. And then we can use that. We have the volumes of the bark samples and the starting masses and the end masses. And then we can get to that number of how much moisture that bark is absorbing through its um, properties of hygroscopicity. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it looks like we've got a hand raised from Bob. Bob, please feel free to ask your question. Uh, a very interesting talk, um, uh, Courtney. Um, I'm a recently retired uh, scientist with the Forest Service in California, and I've been working with Lori and Alan Flint, who's still, have, are you familiar with their work? Uh, I don't think so, no. Uh, uh, they've developed what they call a basin uh, climate model, um, and uh, their, their soil scientist, Lori, is a soil physicist, um, and um, they, they've been looking at um, um, effects of, uh, of, of uh, soil as well as on, um, on hydrology and region. Uh, it seems to me that um, the issues that you raise are uh, are ones that could go into their model. Uh, I think we see parallels in forest types out here uh, relative to uh, as as well as um, um, the um, uh, uh, wetness of a landscape uh, relative to uh, bark characteristics in the uh, species that um, occupy the landscape. Um, so um, uh, it, uh, uh, could I get some um, um, citations from you uh, relative to, uh, to your work and I can pass that on to uh, Lori. Sure, and, and definitely. I. We just published a review paper of mesification that has a lot of this preliminary evidence in there and summarizing the kind of like where we've come since that original Milwaukee and Abrams paper um, in the early 2000s. And so I'm gonna type my email address in the chat. And if you wanna shoot me an email, I'll send you that paper and everything. But uh, there's definitely lots of similarities between western forests and eastern forests you know with the exclusion of natural fire regimes and the overcrowding of our forests they're certainly existing in different climate settings you know we've got the humid east and and the very dry west and um one of the the things that i'm really interested in in the eastern us is that you know like a lot of the inputs into our fire models are based on parameters of western tree species and we don't really have all of those same parameters for how trees respond to fire um, because they're not the same. And so like we have really good information about bark characteristics of Western conifers to feed into the fire models. Uh, but we don't have those same characteristics of Eastern species. I know that there's some labs that are working on that to, to increase that, that knowledge there. Um, and then our, the four, the, by the responses of the ecosystems in the Western United States are much more dramatic because those are high intensity infrequent fires, right? And so the impact that they have on those ecosystems are catastrophic and for soils and for water. But in the Eastern United States, we're having frequent low intensity fires. And so 
we don't really have a good understanding on what happens when you burn a sand every three years. How do the soils change? Are we impacting soil biogeochemistry? Um, and and that, that's going a little bit beyond what I talked about in this talk, but that's still part of this kind of like bigger question of mesification and, and what we're doing management-wise to try to combat the process and, and what those management decisions Impact, what, what those management decisions have on kind of like the ecosystem level nutrient and water cycles too. But yeah, I'm going to type my email address into the chat and feel free to shoot me an email and I'll send you some of those citations. Okay, I'll, I'll do likewise in my, uh, on the chat. Uh, as as a, a further note, I just attended the Yosemite hydroclimate meeting and mm -hmm. um, and, and including indigenous peoples in the fire. I think, I don't, I don't know if my screen cut off or Bob cut off, but I didn't hear anything else he said after including indigenous peoples. Yeah, I think his sound cut off on my end as well. Bob, are you still with us? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, would you mind repeating your question? Oh, wait a minute. Oh. No, it, uh, it, it, was a, it was a comment, and that's, that's, there's a lot of talk now out here about including indigenous people into uh, fire management. Yeah, yeah, especially in the Western United States. I know that um, getting buy-in from tribal nations and, and including them in the management decisions and helping them be part of that land steward stewardship um, is, is one of the main challenges and where a lot of people are focusing their efforts in landscape restoration these days. And I, I agree, it's fantastic it's the direction that we need to be going to be able to kind of overcome these management challenges that we have. Thank you. Thank you. So it looks like we're at time right now, but Courtney, if there's any additional questions, would you have a minute to stick around for them? Sure. All right. Does anyone have any follow up questions for Dr. Secret this afternoon? Um, I got a quick question. Uh, is it okay? Yeah. Thank you for a great talk. And uh, we also have the um, we uh, oak regeneration programs um, in Michigan too. And it seems like it's in part because of the, uh, um, the de over abundant deer and they really like, uh, like uh, trim the uh, oak seedling. And I'm wondering if it's also the case in your state. Absolutely. And I have a colleague, my colleague, Marcus Lashley, he is a deer biologist and he was here at Mississippi State and he's at the University of Florida now. <clears throat> and one of the things that he's found is that when we burn forests, when we when we do prescribe fire on forests in like the natural historical time, which would have been through lightning strikes in the early summer, June, July, August, um, the when the trees re-sprout after that, when the oaks and the maples and everything re-sprout after that, they're going to re-sprout with higher nutritional densities just because of the physiology of what's going on. And that deer actually prefer the competitors, the red maple and everything over the oaks at that period of time. And that period of time also coincides with um, like the reproductive cycle of white-tailed deer as well. And so, he has this hypothesis that, you know, it's going to take some time to, to test it and, and get results out of it, but that, um, that there's a connection between the natural fire regime for lightning strikes and deer regeneration and their control on um, some of the mesophytes, some of the encroaching species that would actually in the end benefit oak regeneration. And so now that we've kind of eliminate all of that in landscape, the deer are hungry and they want to eat the oak and they're eating the mass that the oak produced too. Um, but I think that it's a really interesting connection that um, we, that, that is, it'll be interesting to see what he finds moving forward. But, but yes, as it, and under our current conditions, deer 
are a major, those herbivores are a major um, stressor on oak regeneration in the Southeast too. Thank you. Yeah. Courtney, thank you again for what I think was an amazing talk. I know that you shared your, um, your email address in the chat. Is, is it okay if folks reach out to you with any additional questions they may have? Absolutely, yeah. I'd be happy to talk with anyone. Awesome. Well, then on that note, um, please join me in thanking Dr. Seeger for her time this afternoon. And thank you all for joining. And we'll look forward to catching you at the next Hanover Series seminar. Have a great afternoon. Bye. Thank you.